What is going on guys welcome back to C++ tutorial series in today's video we're going to talk about storage classes so let us get right into it. Now storage classes are probably the first topic that we're talking about that you're probably not going to encounter in Python in Java and C sharp. Uh, because it's a little bit more low level we're talking about memory management here uh, manual memory management and uh, this is done to optimize performance and since this is not a very advanced topic uh, yes it's new to everyone who's watching who's not coding in C, C++, Rust or something like that. Uh, it's a new topic, but it's not very complicated. And we're going to talk about the storage classes, uh, since they are some somewhat related to working with variables and uh, data types and so on. Um, and we have six storage classes, we're going to talk about four of those in a little bit more detail. And we're going to just mention two of them for the sake of completeness here. The first one that we're going to talk about is the auto storage class. And uh, actually, it's the default storage class. So when you use the keyword auto, you're actually doing the same thing that you're doing when you're not using a keyword at all. So automatic storage duration means that uh, the compiler figures out itself, uh, how long a variable should be stored. Um, and this is the default thing. So if you just say int a equals 10, this storage class is already auto, so automatic storage um, duration. However, what you can do with auto that you cannot do with the normal way of declaring variables is you can make the data type automatic. So you can say auto a equals 10. And the compiler is going to figure out that this has to be an integer. Now don't confuse this with dynamic typing. Uh, C++ is statically typed, it's not dynamically typed like Python. Um, the compiler will figure out that this is an integer. So it's going to be a static, uh, statically typed integer. Um, you cannot just go ahead and, and make this dynamically typed here. It's just that you don't have to specify it. Um, this of course, slightly increases the, um, the compiler time, but it's not negligible. It's not something that you need to worry about too much. But if you want to choose the auto keyword in order to not specify the data type yourself, the compiler is going to do it for you. Uh, you don't need to worry about that. But except for that, you don't have any differences than just saying int a int Come on, int a equals 10. It's the same thing because the auto storage class is actually the same as not not specifying a storage class at all. All right, so the second storage class that we're going to talk about is called extern like that extern and e. And what this does is it tells the compiler that there is this integer e, which is global, it's accessible from multiple files, it's uh, public global, whatever. Uh, and how this works is that you have one file, we're talking about multiple files here, otherwise this storage class doesn't make a lot of sense. And I know we haven't talked about header files yet. Uh, but the idea is that you have uh, somewhere you define this integer e, let's say in this file, you define it, not, not with the extern keyword, but just integer e, and then you do something with it like e equals 10 or whatever. And then in another file, let's say this down here is another file, you would say extern int e, and by doing that, every every other file that includes that file where this is written has now access to E, which is defined here. So this essentially tells the compiler that, uh, or, or it says there exists some integer E that's globally accessible. So it specifies the existence, it declares the existence. The compiler doesn't care about where this uh, integer E is defined. It just cares about that it is defined and we know that uh, it's globally accessible. So we can work with it throughout different files. And this extern keyword specifies exactly that. So when we say extern int e, we cannot define it. So you cannot do something like extern int e equals 10 because extern int e just specifies there is somewhere this integer e and it's globally accessible and you can use it in this file and in every file that it, that includes this file. This is just specifying that there is this integer e out there somewhere and we can use it here. So we can say C out e, for example, of course, we need to use namespace std and so on. Uh, but this is how it works, you say there is this integer e somewhere and I can use it in this file here. So for the next storage class, we're going to get a little bit more technical, the storage class is called static, like static in a equals 10. And it has to do with memory allocation and with scope. And if you've never programmed before, you probably don't know what scope is. If you've programmed in Python, Java or C sharp, you probably know what scope is already. Um, it's essentially just an area of, uh, you could say accessibility, 
let's say for example, I define int a equals 10 here. This is the scope where a is defined. This is the scope here. The main function is the scope. I have this curl, uh, these curly brackets here. And if I say int a equals 10, this is the scope of that variable. Now I know we haven't talked about functions yet, but I, I'm going to just uh, give you a quick example here. Let's say we have another function here into my function uh, that does something we're not going to care about the function signature or something like that in detail. Uh, but here I can also define a variable, let's say I have int b equals 20. Now, because of the scope, because of the scope of a, a is defined for the main function, I cannot access uh, a in here, I cannot say c out a. Now, even if I say, of course, using namespace std, not best practice, remember, uh, I cannot go ahead and say c out a, because a is not defined in that particular scope here. In the same, uh, in the same way, I cannot use b in the main function, because b is defined in that scope here. Whereas if I say something like int c equals uh, 30 here, I can access c in here. And I can access C in here because the scope of C is the whole, uh, the whole file here. Now, again, we're not going to talk too much about functions. But the idea of the static storage class is that, um, or actually, let's talk about what happens if we don't use the static storage class, whenever you define a variable like int b equals 10, what the program does during runtime is it allocates the memory uh, for b, and then it does something. So this function does something. Uh, and in the end, we're done with the function, we, we return a value here, like return zero, for example, and this function is done. And what we do is we get back to main, we get out of the function scope here. And what we usually do is we free the memory that was allocated for B. So B allocates memory does something. And once it's out of scope, it's deleted again, we free the memory, we don't need the memory anymore, the block is freed. And next time we get into my function, we need to allocate it again. So let's say I call my function multiple times, what happens is I allocate uh, memory for B, I do something with it. And then once I get out of the function, I free this memory, I delete B. And then next time, again, I allocate, I free, I allocate, I free and so on. Now, if we do that, uh, if we don't want to do that, if we want to have a static allocation, if we want to have the allocation being valid until the whole program is terminated, uh, what we can do is we can say static. So static int a equals 10, for example. Now, in this case, this would be useless because the main function is all there is. So essentially, the scope doesn't end until the whole program terminates. But uh, if we define static int a in another function, let's say in my function that we wrote down below uh, a couple of seconds ago, if we do it there, this means that once we get to that point, once once we get to the point that a is allocated, it's not going to be freed until the program terminates. This is what the static keyword does. It allocates the memory for a and it doesn't free that memory even if we get out of scope, which means that next time when we get in scope or inside of scope, next time we call that function, the memory for a is already allocated and doesn't need to be allocated again, it's already there. And because of that, this can increase performance, of course, it doesn't free the memory. So it's you could say, uh, uselessly allocated, it's allocated, even though you don't need it. So you're taking up more space in a sense. But because of that, you don't need to reallocate it once you need it again. So if you know that you're going to use a function frequently, and you're going to use uh, a certain variable frequently, and you don't want to uh, reallocate it every time it gets out of scope, or, or actually, you don't want to free it when it gets out of scope, and you don't want to reallocate it once you get inside of scope again, if you want to have this allocated all the time in order to save that, uh, that runtime that you're using to allocate the memory, you can use a static storage class in order to do that. And this can uh, sometimes increase performance. So for the next storage class, we're going to look at how variables are actually stored when we define them, let's say we say int a equals 10, what is happening here. Now, first of all, we look at the data type, and we know we need four bytes for an integer. So what we do is we go into the RAM and we allocate a block, a memory block that has four bytes, and we save the value or we store the value 10 inside of that block inside of those four bytes. Now, whenever I say something like a plus equals 10, what happens is the CPO goes to the RAM, gets the value from that memory block, applies the arithmetic operation, and then stores that value back into the RAM. And the RAM is a very fast memory, it's very efficient. So it's very fast. Um, but 
still sometimes you might want to have the actual variable closer to the CPU. It's not always possible, but sometimes a variable is going or an object is going to be accessed very, very often and you want to have it close to the CPU and not save it in a RAM, but you want to save it in one of the registers of the CPU. And if you want to do that, you can use the register keyword. Register uh, int i equals 10, for example. In this case, if it's possible, only if it's possible, we're going to store that int i into a register rather than the RAM. Now, what do I mean by if, if it's possible? This means that sometimes, of course, we don't have free registers. The RAM is quite big nowadays, so we have a lot of space there. Uh, we're not likely to run out of RAM unless, you know, we're programming a giant application. Uh, but usually you will always have some space in the RAM. However, you're not always going to find a free register. And if you don't find a, re a free register, what's going to happen is you're going to allocate normal RAM uh, memory. So you're just going to access the RAM again, you're going to allocate a block of memory inside of the RAM instead of a register. But if a register is free, so this is not a guarantee that you're going to save this variable in um, or this object inside of a register, it only says if there is a free register, yes, I'm going to use it, I'm going to allocate, uh, I'm, I'm going to store the object or the variable inside of that register instead of the RAM. And because of that, the access to that, um, to that, uh, variable is going to be way faster because it's actually in the CPU. You don't have to go the way or the CPU doesn't have to go the way to the RAM to access it, to process it and then to store it back into the RAM. It's actually in the CPU already in the registers of the CPU. So this is again something that you can use to increase performance. Of course, however, don't abuse this quote unquote. I mean, abuse is probably not the right word here, but don't overuse this. Don't store everything in a register just because you think that's going to make your program faster. You want to select very few um, objects or variables that you're going to store in the register because they're going to be accessed faster um, than the ordinary uh, variables or objects that are stored in the RAM. So if you know that something is going to, is going to be used very, very often, very frequently, you might want to store it in a register instead of the RAM. Uh, but of course, don't overuse this. Now, one thing that you need to know here, uh, if you are going to use a register uh, storage class is that you cannot use pointers. And I know we haven't talked about pointers yet, and you probably don't know what pointers are if you've never coded in C, C++, uh, Go, Rust, or something like that. Uh, but essentially, a pointer is just something, an object, let's say, that points to a memory address. And of course, if the integer, if the object is not stored in the RAM, but in the register, it doesn't have a memory address of the RAM. So I'm going to show you real quickly what it's going to do. Uh, we're not going to talk about pointers yet. We're going to have a special video on pointers. But essentially, I'm going to show you that like that, you can access uh, the memory address of, uh, of an object here. And probably we're not going to uh, see the register here because the register is not always free. Actually, it's pretty unlikely to have a free register. Uh, and because of that, we can see a memory address here. This is the RAM memory address. So in this case, we didn't store it in a register. We stored it in we stored it in a uh, in a normal memory block in the RAM because there was no free register. Uh, if there was a free register, we would not be able to do this. We would not be able to see a memory address here. We would see something like register. I'm I'm not actually sure what we get here. I'm also not sure if we can use the size of operator, but I think we should be able to do it. Um, but the fact is, if you store, if you successfully store an object or a variable inside of a register, you're not able to access it with pointers, you cannot point to its memory address, because it doesn't have an address, it has a register, it's a register for this variable. So this is something that you can do to increase the performance of your program even more. So last but not least, for the sake of completeness, we're also going to mention the other two storage classes as well. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about them, just mention that they exist. And the first one is called mutable, mutable, and it has to do with constants and classes. And it's not important yet, because we've not uh, reached uh, object oriented programming yet. And the second one is called threat local. And it's something that was introduced with C++ 11, I think. And this is also something that we're not going to talk about yet, because it has to do with threats. Um, again, just wanted to mention them for the sake of completeness. We also have mutable and thread local. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting a like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.